Hey everyone in Photo Lover Land, you are listening to I Love Photography Live and this is a very special edition of I Love Photography Live because it's our annual roundup of 52 reasons why we love photography. Uh, we publish this blog uh, on our blog at blog.photoshelter.com so you can follow along with us but we've cherry picked some of the uh, our favorites of our favorites. Yes. I'm joined as always by my co-host Sarah Jacobs. Hey Sarah. Hey, Alan. How you doing? I'm doing okay. We had a little holiday party last night. We're feeling a little maybe dehydrated would be a nice, a nice term. Got my Poland spring right here. <laughs> <Doing great. laughs> right. I've got some tea as well, so we're we're rehydrating. Uh, we lost some uh, some electrolytes, so it's good to do that. You might be listening to us uh, by downloading the podcast by going to iTunes and looking for Isla Photography, or maybe you're watching us on our YouTube station at youtube.com slash photoshelter. Whatever the case may be, we're happy to have you. And why don't we dive in? Um, first of all, you got to check out the blog. Check out the blog. There's some nice photography. We talk about it. I write some uh, little snarky comments, and sometimes they're not snarky. And sometimes they're just, you know, they warm the heart a little bit. Yes. Um, and so why don't we start with possibly the most heartwarming thing that we saw this year, and it's Johnny Nguyen's photo of uh, da Devante Hart hugging a policeman at a rally in Portland. Yeah. And the incredible, well, there's a, a few incredible things about this. Uh, first of all, it's Johnny's first published photo ever, which is just kind of hard to believe, mm. right? Because it looks like the guy obviously knew what he was doing. And secondly, this little kid, Devante Hart, is one of three siblings adopted by white parents... Devante grew up in like rough and tumble area, drugs and gang violence and all this kind of stuff, um, but apparently is like a really wonderful little kid and obviously very empathetic. So he was walking around this uh, rally in Portland with a free hugs sign and a cop came up to him and they struck up a conversation and then at the end the cop said, can I have a hug? And Johnny had sort of been following the kid around because he kind of saw what this kid was doing and he got this photo. Yeah, he knew that the, the story was going to be with the kid, which I really I really like. And that that's the sign of a good photographer. Sees For the sure. kid, knows the story is going to be there and just sticks it out till a moment like this happens. And you know, I saw a comment. I think we posted this on our Facebook page. And one of the comments was staged photo. Oh. It's like come on people. No. Y is... You know what? You know what makes me angry about like photography like when a photographer is good enough and he, he identifies an area or a person that he's gonna follow because he's reading the crowd or whatever he knows like he knows something about something mm -hmm. or she knows something about something and then they they end up getting a really good photo and then the you know some segment of the public's reaction is oh that's staged no it's not it's called being a good photographer mm -hmm. <laughs> So no, this is not a staged photo. The the story is heartwarming. I think if the commenter had read uh, the backstory, they would have uh, felt a little foolish about that. I hope so. I hope so. <laughs> Over on Wired, um, uh, a story called "The Laborers Who Keep Dick Pics and Beheadings Out of Your Facebook Feed." Most people don't realize it. I didn't really realize it, but uh, Facebook every time you upload an image at least some proportion of those images get sent to a human for review. I think obviously given the number of photos that are uploaded every day, whatever it is, like a billion photos or hundreds of millions of photos that are uploaded a day, that a computer is scanning a lot of them. But when the computer says, I'm not quite sure, but I think that this might be something you should look at, uh, this company, in this particular case, out of the Philippines, has people sitting in their cubicles reviewing just the most god awful images. Yeah. Ever. Just the, the worst. This the is the worst job maybe maybe in the world. What top 5 worst jobs? Certainly in, the world. in photography this is probably one of the worst. Oh, in, in photography. In photography absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. I I I recently had a a very graphic image come through my my Twitter feed just this week and I just it was so jarring and disturbing and it it just it reminded me of these people that yeah. are doing this day in and day out looking at these really disturbing images and I mean it's terrible but and the wired article mentions like a lot of them will do it for a few months and then cease working because it's that 
it really screws you up seeing all this stuff. You can't unsee like a beheading video or a beheading pic or a child pornography or just, you know. Right. And why the heck people are trying to upload this stuff to Facebook in the first place? I mean, God. Yeah. There's some real... People have some problems, man. <sighs> yeah. Super interesting article, whatever the case is. Yeah, this came out back in October. Yeah. On Wired. Yeah. But very interesting. Um, Joanna Toro is a Colombian... Uh, I don't even know whether she's an immigrant. She came to uh, New York to study English. So I don't necessarily, at least in the article, you couldn't say that she's trying to become an immigrant or anything. But at any rate, her uh, someone she knew said, oh, you ought to come down to Times Square. I wear these costumes. There's a whole like uh, subculture of people who wear the costumes. And in a lot of places, you see this in L.A. and Vegas and whatnot, who put on character costumes. Um, tourists will take photos with them, and then they'll make a buck. So Joanna goes down there, tries a bunch of different costumes, decides that she wants to wear the Hello Kitty one. Because <laughs> she's treated the nice. <laughs> she's treated the nicest, yeah, which is, you know, which is smart. Because these people, people go up to these people and they think, oh, I'm in costume. They're in costume, so I'll just punch them in the gut. Right. Like padded. No, come on, man. Why are you punching the character? Uh, but Joanna then took her camera out, and I don't even know. I mean, the, the the article doesn't even say that she was a photographer. She just said, "I I need to document this stuff." Yeah, this is just a, a great example of having that unique access and actually being a part of the world. And you know, the images aren't like super fantastic or anything. Right. They're great, but it's like, but this is something that, you know, you just you see them in Times Square, but you don't think about. It's it's sad, but you don't think about the people in them. You know, but they they all have stories and different reasons for doing this, and they're just trying to get by and support their families. And I mean, it it it's a little um, it's a little bit of a loss of innocence moment when you see. I don't know whether this is Oscar the Grouch or Cookie Monster. Or something. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> but you see, like you know, a middle aged dude smoking a cigarette on his break. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you're right. It takes I, away you know, the magic. They're, they're out there in, in, in all kinds of weather. They're, they must be sweating to death during the summer. Oh, man. I don't yeah. know what they do when they have to go use the bathroom. I mean, there's just a lot of logistical issues. Right. So a really fascinating article. And, the, you know, the other interesting thing is, so Joanna took these photos, but they're being distributed by Redux. So whoever, whatever photo editor over at Redux said, whoa, this is really interesting, even though it's not professionally shot this is as you said it's an access issue and the and the images and the story is fantastic all right Joanna we like it we like it <laughs> this uh, feature shoot story um, on quote romance tourism and it's by the Danish photographer Sophie Amelie Klugart and she went uh, down to I think it was Kenya, yes, Kenya, where she found again this other subculture of young, strapping, you know, buff Kenyan dudes, and all of these white women who go to Kenya on quote romance tourism, but it's clearly a form of sex tourism. Um, and it's it's a funny juxtaposition because you know normally when you think about sex tourism, you think like creepy dude mm. in Asia. Yep, yep. Right? You think mm. like creepy white dude went from America to go molest like some little Thai boy or little Thai girl or something like that. And this is middle-aged women who are basically like really lonely or like that, that's, that's the gist that you get. And that's certainly the feeling that you get from the photos, which is kind of life has dealt them a series of blows and then and they can't. They can't find emotional connections with people, but they're still kind of yearning for physical affection. And this, I mean, this woman yeah. fan just sort of kills me. Yeah. It's like no makeup, hair pulled back. You see the lines on her face and the sun damage, and you're like, wow, that lady's lived a hard life and just not very happy. I, I remember when we first talked about this on the show a few months ago, and I was surprised you. I was surprised you included it on the list. I was pleasantly surprised. Mm. Um, yeah, I w I didn't know how much you enjoyed it, but I mean, they're beautiful portraits. The photos are incredible. Yeah, they really are. And I think that that 
the, you know, what makes a good photo story is also the backstory. And the story is, is, is really very interesting. Mm -hmm. And it, it's like a total reversal of like the male version of the story where the male goes to Asia and it's like little kids and all this kind of weird, I mean, it's not always little kids, but you know, that's again <laughs> the stereotype that you get in your mind. Right. But this is like going to Africa of all places. Mm -hmm. Africa. And then all of these like lonely women. And it's funny, you know, we've talked a lot about race uh, in the past year. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and certainly in the past few months, uh, given all the stuff that's going on in Ferguson and New York and all over the country. Um, so it's funny to see white women going to black men as sort of a savior in some ways mm -hmm. uh, to find this romance, and and it's just it's just interesting. Yeah, very different than what we're seeing in mainstream news. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we love these uh, photos <laughs> of John Malkovich, um, taken by a fashion photographer. Sandro Miller, who's also a director. I believe he directed like a Nikon commercial as well when they came out with one of their digital SLRs and he filmed it all on, on DSLR. Um, how the heck he convinced Malkovich to do this? I mean, I guess they're buddies. Yeah. <laughs> but the photos are just so funny. I know, they're, they're fantastic. I love seeing artists collaborate like this. And they, they just, they did so many. The, the series so is many. fantastic. And John Malkovich just nails it every time, whoever he's posing as. Yes. Here he's yes. Alfred Hitchcock. And we said at the time, what did we say at the time? Hmm. I forgot what we said at the time. It was just, it's, it's like, how many, how many can you identify? Right. Um, without, without knowing. And the other part is, looking at some of these, you kind of can't even tell. Like, if you look quickly, you don't even know that, that it's the fake portrait. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Especially uh, him as Andy Warhol. Yeah, Andy Warhol, look, it looks like Andy Warhol. And, of course, you know, it's all filtered and he's got the wig on and everything. But even, even this photo, which is clearly not the migrant mother, if you looked at it, it's so close to the migrant mother that you might think it's the migrant mother. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's, it's amazing. Hats so, off to John Malcolm. Yeah, man, for being a good sport and doing that. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. I love that. I, I have said from the start during the summer that I thought some of the best photos uh, in photojournalism this year were coming out of Ferguson. Um, it was a ripe visual story. Uh, you know, the whole hands up, don't shoot uh, meme that sort of came out of it um, is obviously, you know, creates this framing like you see here. And then we saw a lot of uh, photos of cars on fire and people doing that hands up don't shoot pose and silhouette against the fire and then of course the photographers that are shooting there for the, the St. Louis Post Dispatch and then Scott Olson who was arrested at least one time as far as I know who works for Getty Images also just 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 killing it with the photography there like really really amazing uh, stuff coming out of there yeah, it, it's it's insane that almost just how much of a war zone it looks like, and then you're like, this is in Missouri, like this is in America, this is ridiculous, you know. And it Scott, is ridiculous. It is Scott. Scott's kind of my hero. He got he got arrested because he had fail, failure to comply with the police saying, you know, you need to leave this area and stop shooting, which there was no real reason for him to do. He wasn't in danger. Right. Um. And when he was released from jail, he just immediately asked his lawyer, like, what? what happens if I get arrested again? And the lawyer was just like, hey, man, we'll just come pick you up again. And he was like, great, because yeah. I want to keep shooting. Yeah. You know, like, what a, what a badass. What a great guy. <laughs> you know, I, I went out to Ferguson this, uh, this summer, um, and I talked to some of the photographers there. And I think it was Rob Cohen. Or who did, who did we interview? Was it Rob from the St. Louis Dispatch? Uh, I'm drawing a blank. Whatever the case is, he said on the first night of rioting, it, it actually was pretty dicey. Um, I think in part because, you know, that first night it's still chaotic. Nobody really knows the rules of engagement and whatnot. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily say that the ph photographers weren't in danger during that period, but I think that as time went on, um, the, the, the protesters understood the value of having photographers there. And then both sides sort of understood, like, like any situation that's covered by the media, it's a media war. You're trying to portray your side uh, in the best possible light. 
and get the, the narrative that you want across as effectively as possible. Uh, whatever the case may be, I mean, I, I really hope that uh, the Pulitzer Prize for feature journalism and for spot news come out of Ferguson because I think that, that, that again, it, it, the photography was wonderful and it's important for young photographers to realize that you don't have to go to Syria or Libya or Iraq or Afghanistan to make good pictures and impactful pictures. Yeah, who knows? It could be it could be Scott Olson with that cover he did for Time of the the person on their knees, hands up, yeah, fire silhouetted, yeah, with just a blaze in front of them, which inspired also the New Yorker cover, which was an illustration. Oh so, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. a very iconic photo out of Ferguson. So I look forward to seeing uh, Pulitzer's uh, next year. Yeah. Should be when do those come out again? Ah, yeah, I wish I knew. I yeah. I remember us <laughs> talking about this year's. Everyone's talking. Uh, Vivian Mayer, the French nanny working in Chicago, who, for whatever reasons, uh, had a camera with her and took a lot, a lot of photos. But she wasn't a professional photographer, nor did she try to publicize the fact that she was taking photographers in her lifetime. Amassed thousands and thousands of some of the best street photography the world has ever seen. <laughs> and that's not hyperbole at all. She she is one of probably like top three street photographers in the history of photography. They need to rewrite the books. They they and, and people are already. But so anyway, this guy uh, John Maloof uh, started collecting. He he found a cache of her stuff, and he's like, oh my god. And then over the course of the next few years, he acquired more. He would buy other people that had my year's uh, photos. And then there's a whole backstory of who who actually owns the copyright. So he has the negs, but does he own the copyright? And who are her heirs? Who are her rightful heirs? She didn't really have any heirs, or they had trouble tracking them down. So the whole backstory is fascinating. But this year we saw a new documentary that came out and a new book that came out. The book I have, I just I bought it uh, two weeks ago from Amazon, and it's sitting on my bookshelf. And it's just amazing stuff. Amazing. So if you don't know Vivian Mayer, you have to. If you're if you're a connoisseur of photography, you have to know who she is. And it's just amazing in so many ways, being a female photographer in her era, being not a professional, not seeking publicity for them, just taking pictures seemingly for the love of photography. And then somebody finds it, and then everyone's like, "Oh my God, who's it's like? It's like you discovered treasure." Yeah, yeah, it was a treasure trove. Uh, so I haven't seen the documentary yet, but I certainly want to do it. And I think that someone in Hollywood needs to make this into like a like a real like a drama. Oh. Who would play Vivian Mayer? I don't even know what she <laughs> looks like. She took a lot of selfies. She did take some selfies, right? She was like a she was a nanny. She was a younger a younger woman in a lot of those photos. Yeah, yeah. But it was such like there's such a feeling of of romance in a lot of the photos, and we saw some where she was literally like on the red carpet. I guess she was passing by a movie premiere, and she would take a photo of the stars going into the theater before before they had to rope off paparazzi and all that stuff. And obviously, there, not that many people had cameras like there are now. And a nanny, you know, pushing a carriage and taking a photo, I guess, doesn't really raise any red flags. <laughs> no. Nope. Amazing stuff. Jonas Bendixson, a uh, Magnum photographer, went to Brazil during the World Cup, but he didn't shoot the games. He shot a lot of stuff outside of the games, and he took a high-speed camera and he created what he calls still films. So he was in Sao Paulo, and here is an example, and of course we're watching this over the internet through uh, Google Hangouts, so it's going to be a little choppy for you, but really, really fantastic <laughs> fan. stuff. Yeah, here's a, a fan, fan reaction yeah. to the games. These are, these are so mesmerizing. I could just watch them all day. I think he should start doing way more of these oh, yeah. with whatever projects he's working on and, and also get into like music video stuff. He should be working with musicians. This stuff is great. The, you know, uh, slow-mo in and of itself is pretty mesmerizing. 
but then you combine slow mo with someone that actually knows how to take a photo mm -hmm. and understands, you know, reaction and human emotion and whatnot. And yeah, this kind of stuff, and it's still going. Look at this; we're still going. I know, <laughs> I know. His framing is amazing. Oh. I mean, and then and then you can just tell that he waits waits for that moment to happen. Yeah, and people I love, running through the shot or you know whatever. It's great. There was there was like a lot of fan reaction uh, films, but he also had you know a lot of these moments that were kind of farther away. Um, there was one where kids are playing soccer on the street. Um, and there's just really, really neat little moments. And, you know, they color graded it, so there's kind of a nostalgic 70s look to everything, which I think is part of the, part of the charm. But whatever the case is, these are, these are lovely. And makes me, I wish I had a high-speed camera. Well, I, my iPhone has a pretty good oh, high-speed yeah. camera. Yeah. But, uh, so maybe I need to try this. Huh. Yeah. <laughs> Um, we, you know, the, the, the list that we compiled for these 52 reasons um, to love photography right now, you get to the end of the year and you see a lot of uh, compilation lists of photography, like 100 best photos. Um, and we've never been really interested in doing that, which is just talking about these are our best photos that we thought. So much of what we talk about on the show and so much about uh, of what we write about on the blog is really about sort of the intersection of, of culture and photography and business and photography and, and whatnot. And one of the interesting things that came out of it was this diptych of uh, high school senior Tyler Atkins. He didn't come up with the hashtag uh, if they gunned me down. But he's kind of, his photo is kind of the one on Twitter that, that, went viral. And when Mike Brown was killed in, uh, in Missouri, the photos that came out of Mike Brown initially were all of these photos where he's looking kind of thuggish. And Tyler Atkins really challenged that. Tyler Atkins is, is you know, he plays in the jazz band and he's like an honor roll student or something like that. I mean, he's a, he's a very accomplished young kid. And he said, what, what photo would the media choose to represent me? And so the one on the left where he's kind of looking like a rapper, he, he is a rapper in that one, but he's rapping about his math class. <laughs> and then the one on the right, uh, again, is, is uh, him playing in the jazz band. And it's funny how, you know, you think of the media trying to be neutral. Of course, we don't know they're neutral, but, but even something as seemingly innocuous as what, what singular photo are you going to choose to represent this person, this deceased person. Because all we have now is, you know, everybody goes to this person's Facebook page and they, they have a hundred or a few thousand photos and then they pick one to be the image. And of course the one of Mike Brown where he's kind of on his porch and kind of making a gang sign or whatever he was doing, some sort of affectation to be like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a tough teenager or whatever, is the one that everyone picked up. It's like once once the mainstream outlet picks that image, that becomes the image that rep represents that person. So it was super interesting, and I saw friends of mine, uh, uh, friends, people of color who are in college, who kind of hopped on this this train as well, and would do these diptychs, and it did really make me think. And you know, I was going through like my photos on Facebook and thinking, well, what what would the media pick for me? <laughs> There are a lot of like you know drunk Alan photos on Facebook, <laughs> <laughs> along with other you know more businessy photos or photos with my friends, etc. So uh, it's just it's just interesting. It's interesting, you no? Know? And it it really I think initially before any information was out about the case, a lot of people immediately said, "Oh, this kid is a gang banger. Look at him on his porch." making visceral reactions like we all do, but that it wasn't necessarily fair. I mean, we still don't know what happened that day, and we don't know what is right or wrong, but we know that the initial photos that went out were sort of portrayed him in a negative light. So good for this viral campaign, and good for the media to also comment on this, and good for the media to then go back and start pulling photos of Mike Brown smiling. Which I which I've seen more recently. It's just like, oh yeah, he was a he was a, a teenager. He was 18 years old. 
you know. And just like this kid, Tyler Atkins, he's a teenager. Everybody's like struggling with their identity as like young adults. Everybody wants to appear cool and tough and whatnot. And you know, photos have a weird effect. Speaking of photos that have a weird effect, here are tintype images from Sundance taken by Victoria Will. Some really, really nice stuff. Yeah, she said she was inspired by the Penubra Foundation here in New York, which, if you don't know about, is an awesome nonprofit that has a bunch of classes uh, for all different types of alternative photography that has existed throughout the history of photo, including tintypes and sanotypes. And she had had her tintype done at Photoville the year before, and she just loved the process and thought the outcome was beautiful. And so she went back to Sundance and was like, Let's do this differently this year. We we were out at Photoville this summer, and we contemplated getting our tintype. It was just was yeah. going to take too long. That's right. It was. <laughs> but I kind of, I still kind of want to do it. Yeah. Yeah. No. I mean, they just it's beautiful. You definitely should. Uh, it everyone looks so cool in the tintype, even though you know in some cases it really brings out like the wrinkles mm -hmm. here with uh, William H Macy. But it just it looks like everyone looks like a cowboy. I know, I know. You look old and wise automatically in a tintype, <laughs> and very graceful. Okay, but I want to talk about this one. Oh, yeah. This is like a haunting portrait. Of Philip Seymour Hoffman. Philip Seymour Hoffman, who killed himself this year. Was it this year? Was it this year, right? It was, yeah. Uh, of a heroin overdose. And there's a very ghostly quality. It It's almost like a TV show where they're like, oh, the... We had a medium in here, and they conjured the spirit, and we had a, a blank roll of film, and when we developed it, this is what appeared. But there's, I, I don't know whether we're, I'm, I'm projecting onto this, but there is a very, very ghostly quality to this image. Yeah, um, no, definitely. I mean, he looks very... He looks dead, almost. He, yeah, he, he does. I mean, yeah, I was about to say that, but then didn't want to, but yeah. he, he does. The, his eyes, there's no... There's no sparkle in his eye. It just or or liveliness in, yeah. in his expression or anything. It's very haunting. I'm I'm curious to know. I wish Victoria, you know, published a backstory. And obviously, they only have like a minute with with every star. Right, right. But you know, in some cases, the photographer will direct the actor, and in other cases, the actor will just go up and do whatever they're doing. So I wonder if there was any dialogue and interaction between Victoria and, mm -hmm. and Philip for this photo, whether he was just like, I'm sitting down, blank stare, I right. might be high, I might be drunk. Right. This is what you get. Yeah. Uh, she uh, won the PDN photo annual in the yeah. editorial category for this Rightfully work. so. Yeah. Really, really nice stuff. Yeah. Victoria! <laughs> so, uh, initially when I threw together the list, uh, I whittled everything down and I had uh, 51... Uh, little mini stories, 51 reasons to love photography, and then the day that I was publishing it, <laughs> this photo <laughs> showed up. <laughs> and it's such a ridiculous photo that you think maybe it was staged. Yeah. And and maybe it was, right? But if uh, it wasn't, it's amazing. It's amazing. In case you are listening to the podcast or in case your screen is too small, it's a guy on the New York City subway reading a book called <laughs> How to Meet Women on the Subway. And it was just taken by, by a random girl on random Instagram. Random girl on the subway. And yeah. she writes in her caption, so this is uh, Lana D, L-O-N-I-D-E-E, -E, and she writes in her caption, step number one, hide that book. <laughs> yep, correct. And, you know, you look at the guy, he's like... He's like a decent looking dude. He kind of looks like he has like a Jerry Seinfeld look to him. A little bit of a Jerry Seinfeld look, but but not I mean I, I would argue he's better looking than Jerry Seinfeld. He seems reasonably oh, well dressed. I, I didn't mean that in a bad way at all. <laughs> <laughs> just giving the, the, well, the listeners let's just say, a visual picture. Let's say Jerry's not known for his good looks. Mm -hmm. This guy looks fine. He looks like a normal dude, but I guess again, you know, going back to the <laughs> gun me down, you can't judge a book by its cover. Right. Well, in this case, you can judge the guy by the book he's reading. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you absolutely can. Oh, man. I feel, you know, has anything come out yet about IDing this guy? And if it's if it's not a stage photo, he must be so embarrassed. Yeah, I know. But, but like, maybe he's not. Maybe he has no shame 
because he's sitting there on the subway reading that book. I mean, it's just ridiculous. Yeah, I, it could be like a conversation starter. True. Maybe, some, maybe, maybe some woman is like audacious enough to be like, "Hey, what? You're you're kidding, right?" And then he's like, "Yeah, yeah I'm kidding. Hey, what? Want to have a drink?" <laughs> I mean, I've heard I've heard of crazier stories of guys yeah. girls out. So yeah, true. Who knows? Well, I'm glad that you slapped that one on at the very last minute. Because it's, it's fun. It's the best. I'm very predictable, Sarah, because you know I like to always end up on like a fun note. Yes. And I couldn't think of anything funnier. And again, that's not, it doesn't have to do specifically with photography, but, but photography is a communication medium, and Instagram is a distribution platform, and it's an image that prior to all of the internet and whatnot, like, you'd, you would never have seen this image. Right. Or it would have sort of leaked out, you know, over the course of, like, a year or two and maybe shown up on America's Funniest Home Video. Or, I mean, oh, it's, right. it's, yeah, yeah. it's hard to imagine that, that that ever existed, America's Funniest Home Video, because now YouTube is America's Funniest Home Video. Exactly. And so similarly, this photo, which was taken, I mean, it the day it was taken, it blew up. It went viral. Such is the power of the internet. Yeah. And it's a wonderful thing for photography when, you know, when, when the photo photographer wants to go viral. Well, Sarah, you know, next week uh, is Christmas, so I would suggest to you that we take the week off. Yep. And then the next one after that is New Year's. Is so. New Year's, so maybe we'll take two off. Who knows? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I'm going to be in Hawaii. Are you going home to uh, Texas at all? I'm, I'm going to go to New Mexico. Ah, New Mexico. Yeah, I'm excited. Oh, that'll mm -hmm. be fun. Take some photos out there, too. Absolutely. I'm going to bring my tripod, my camera. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Maybe do a little tintype. Oh, no. Nah. Nah. <laughs> I, I'm all digital now. I don't deal with chemicals. <laughs> I don't do that. <laughs> Well, in that case, oh, we've had a great year of I Love Photography. A great one. Uh, and I, get, I don't know, what show is this, like 43, 40? Yeah, know, something whatever. like that. Something like that. 43, mm -hmm, yep, 43. Well, here's to another 43 episodes, and I can't wait till we get to 50 and 100. That'll be, be some great. good times. <laughs> so, for Sarah Jacobs, this is Alan Murabayashi. Thank you so much for watching. Make sure to check out the full post of 52 Reasons to Love Photography. And until we see you in 20, 2015, signing off, have a great holiday. Take care. Bye-bye.